Turn, turn your microphone on. <laughs> Is that better? There you go. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Okay, so uh, let's have a look. So we're looking today, everyone knows me, David Kent, so we're looking today at digital storytelling. So I thought I'd start off with an introduction and uh, give an example <clears throat> that introduces me. Uh, and it's been made for students to watch and get a feel for the kind of material that they'd use in, um, in a book that uh, we use at Wusong uh, for teaching freshman college students. So it's based on the textbook content. And it sets up, I think, the kind of work expectation that should be met. And I think the way that it's developed, it creates a better connection with me as a teacher over just simply telling them the information and putting it up on the, on the board. Uh, when I developed it, I wanted to have it match with a kind of close exercise for a second movie, a cut-down kind of movie. <coughs> Uh, which is also a self-introduction, uh, and it uses the models from the book. Um, so it aims to deepen that connection uh, that I'm trying to establish with students on the first day, and it models the textbook content specifically, and it aims to really solidify what I want to see from them when they make their own digital stories later on in the unit. And they'd make them on things like, you know, their family, pets, or travel, their major, whatever it is. So I'll play the general introduction um, first, one that I'd use with students, um, <clears throat> and, the, and then I'd elicit some feedback from them about what the story's telling them about me. And I'd model the um, content from the book, put that up on the board as we go. After that, I'd play the second, intro second introduction, match that, as I mentioned, with the listening activity. And uh, for that, I chose a close exercise because it's kind of non-taxing and a familiar thing to do on, a, on the first day. And it's kind of easy to use this content with students and jump in uh, to starting work on something if they don't have a book, which they won't have on the first day. Um, so let's have a look at the self-introduction first, the first one, and uh, we'll, go from, we'll go from there. Hello, <laughs> it's me. Hello, <laughs> is it me you're looking for? <laughs> So, uh, if this is my first class, first day, uh, you'll see that. 
and you should be able to tell me about me. Pretty much a lot of stuff. Um, so if your language, because you never know what language level you're really going to get, if the student's language level is quite low, um, they know a lot about you already from the start. So um, with the, uh, the actual activity I'd use with them, the listening activity, if you look at the next um, slide, it's a bit hard to see it. I thought it'd be a little bit better. Um, but the content on the left is what's in the book. So you basically have different sections, greeting, name, uh, birthplace, school or work, whatever it is. Uh, and I develop a close exercise that matches with the model um, sentences that the students are supposed to learn. Um, so I would then, once we solicit some of the language, I then play the next uh, clip with the close exercise. So let's do that now. Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Kent, but you can call me David. I was born in Australia. My hometown is Sydney. I studied applied linguistics and education. I usually teach graduate students at Busan University. In my free time, I enjoy flying. Someday, I hope to travel again. My dream is to live in Korea for a long time with my wife. Thank you for your attention. Now, class, can you tell me about yourself? Please introduce yourself. Okay, so, uh, kind of simple, kind of easy, right? So, um, now I've seen a bit of uh, an example. We should all be able to answer the question of what is digital storytelling. And to answer that, really, it's essentially multimedia-based stories. And they're stories that are primarily visual and are single themed and they rely on one key point so they're really very succinct and because of that they're one to three minutes in length and they should also help students make meaning from their experiences and the experiences include those um, that they have in the classroom so as educators I think we can use digital storytelling to develop interest in topics by providing things like lesson hooks um, make difficult content more understandable and provide linguistic models and set expectations for our students to follow. And we can normalize the use of technology and multimedia while at the same time facilitating classroom discussion or introduction of various topics that can um, capitalize on the creative talent of students. Uh, the challenge I think though is when students do start to create uh, their own stories they need to really work out uh, meaningful uses of imagery and to use imagery as a mode of communication and a way to reflect their personal um, ideas and experiences so that they can create stories for any kind of audience whether it's their peers or you as a teacher or other stakeholders like parents. So in other words, um, you really, if you're using digital stories, you need to help students develop multimedia literacy or understanding how to consume media and after that you really need to move students towards media fluency or becoming producers of media. In that way they can showcase their understanding in individual, personal and meaningful ways. So depending on how you're going to use a digital story um, with your classes it will depend on the type of story that um, you or your students will develop. And the types can really range from a whole uh, bunch of different things like personal narratives, so talking about events in your real life, um, things that we can do or things we're interested in. Uh, they could be historical events, uh, but they should be more than just mini documentaries in that case. Um, no matter what they are, the stories must inform, instruct or engage students in learning specific content. 
So why use digital storytelling? Well, I think pedagogically it meshes very well with story time, and story time is a staple in education uh, at all levels, but you know, particularly with young learners. Uh, it can also provide targeted learning unique to um, the four skills. So reading, writing, listening, speaking. So for example, um, planning and writing narratives and reviewing peer narratives leads to reading and writing practice, especially when storyboarding or putting together the storyboard for um, the digital story. And when speaking and recording narratives, um, students working with teachers can practice pronunciation, and when watching and rewatching their work, listening skills can be developed while they review content. It can also assist in enlarging vocabulary, and when working in collaborative groups, Students can share their ideas and collect pictures, communicate and engage in unique, authentic experiences together. Those experiences um, can transform their understanding of text, words and images as well. Um, but to see students get involved a little bit more, engage in the learning process, they need to be able to relate the digital story to aspects of their own experience. And you can do this for, through various tasks. And, also previous classroom experiences. So for young kids, maybe digitizing a sing-along book might be useful for that. Um, and for older learners, maybe something like, or activities like um, movie trailers, book trailers, commercials, or virtual tours might be a better kind of thing to make. Some of the challenges, though, will definitely be things that will revolve around um, aspects of copyright. So you need to know what songs you can use, and what images you can use, how much of each you can use, and um, where to find copyright-free content. Another issue, of course, uh, would be technological issues. So whenever you use technology, you should always have a contingency plan in case something doesn't work. There might be some kind of failure. So if you're having students make some kind of digital story, um, it's a good idea that you'd have them submit the work on the Monday, if that's the first class, and then you'd actually play them back on the Wednesday, if that's your second class of the week. So that way, um, you get to find out who's got problems and hasn't done it, you get to find out who's done it, and you get to, the students get to find out if it plays back on the classroom computer or not, because it may not necessarily play back. Um, so to do all of that, you really need um, some, some planning and careful planning at that. So not just in terms of pedagogy, but also in terms of providing mechanisms for assessment and understanding what makes effective content. And for, for digital stories, um, and especially in the EFL, ESL context, effectiveness means really several things. Uh, first, the story needs an overall purpose or a point of view. Second, it needs to have some kind of dramatic question um, to present to the audience and hold attention. It needs to uh, engage the audience, so there needs to be some kind of emotional connection, something that makes people laugh or cry or whatever it might be. There needs to be economy of story detail. Um, it's got to be succinct. And if it's succinct, it helps focus the story. It makes, it, uh, makes the construction process in class a little bit more manageable too. So ideally, you'd limit a narrative to about 500 words or about half a page of text. You wouldn't want to go more than that. Uh, the narrative should be well-paced when it's recorded, so um, you have a rhythm of speech. So it's not just monotone. And to help with, um, with engaging people and having them be interested in, in that story, um, you need some kind of accompanying soundtrack. But I think for our students, uh, especially, um, what it can offer is the gift of voice. It allows them to, to really speak. Especially shy students who don't ever speak in class or engage themselves in group activities. Um, this really does make them um, have to speak. Uh, either using their actual voice, or they can use a written voice, and so they can put captions up. They don't actually have to voice content. Um, either way, they're, they're able to communicate what they're thinking. Also important uh, to consider, I think, is both the appropriate use of language and clarity of voice. 
um, students have to use language that's appropriate to the theme or the topic. They need to speak loud enough and clear enough so that the voice can be heard over any music or other media elements. And it's got to be at a, at a volume that can be heard. So, you know, those students that come up and they speak into their paper or they whisper and you can't hear them, um, if you're using some kind of technique like this, um, if they're actually recording it properly, um, it gives their peers a chance to actually hear that person speak. And it also allows you to uh, um, assess them rather than just have to give them zero because you can't hear a word that they're saying. Um, so, if you're looking at it, using an assessment uh, for digital storytelling, I think a rubric is a good way to start out. So, preferably a prefabricated rubric. Um, so, if you make your make your own one, it's even better. But <clears throat> prefabricated one you know, will consist of different things like the criteria that you're looking at, descriptors of those criteria, and uh, point system. So you should provide it, ideally, before any um, assessment of students so that they understand the aims and goals of the activity and what you're assessing and become aware of what they need to do to meet a good score. So teacher-created rubrics, um, if you can make them, there's a couple of places, Rubistar and iRubric are quite good to look at. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example. And maybe it's not so good. Can you read that? Or? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's just me. It's, these are not prescription glasses. <laughs> They're um, glasses to stop lights and to cut down on glare. So um, it's a bit it's a bit blurry for me. But anyway, so on the side you can see there's five criteria. Um, voices separated into two. Um, but this kind of thing would be uh, is what I use for assessing digital stories. So if we look at voice clarity, for example, uh, it should be clear, loud enough, and syncs to the storyline. And it's out of you know, five points for each one, totals up to about 30, I think, or exactly. <laughs> so once you've got your idea about what you're going to do with your story, or once you've got your way to assess it, um, you'll need to introduce students to actually a method to create um, these things. So um, let's have a look at some tools for that. So popular tools, I think um, there's a, well, there's a number of tools that are available. There's some are free, and all of the ones I'll introduce you to are free, but um, they can get very expensive very quickly. So some of the most popular ones. Uh, for Windows would be Photo Story 3 and Movie Maker. Um, Photo Story 3 is quite easy to use. It relies on a wizard, guides you through things. It's kid-friendly um, because it's simply laid out and uh, it's a lot, I think, a lot less complex and a lot easier to use than Movie Maker. Other options uh, for Macs might be something like iMovie. And let's see. WeVideo for web and ad-based use is um, a good choice. And it's actually the one that I use in class to provide tutorials and introduce students to, um, to the concept. <coughs> I, I use it because it's free and it limits your production to two minutes. So students cannot physically go any longer than that. Um, and it resets every month. So whatever you use this month, if you use a minute, you know, next month goes back to two minutes. So you could use it every four weeks, or you could just use it once. Uh, so that's the main reason I use it. The other reason I use it is because it's cross-platform friendly. It works on everything. So you can access it through a browser, you can access it through an Android phone, an iPhone, or whatever. Um, and when I've introduced it, most students do use it. It's in English. Um, I've found probably about 70-80% would use it. The rest would use something like Kakao or Movie Maker, which can be in Korean. So I'll play, because I wasn't sure if we'd have Wi-Fi. I made a small um, kind of mini fast tutorial to show you what it kind of looks like. So let's have a look.
So uh, kind of quick, but it sets up how easy it is. It's very drag and drop and just kind of works with all different things. Uh, and it will save the video to YouTube or um, Google Drive, Facebook, a whole bunch of places. Um, so the, the example that I just put together there kind of looks like this one. The alphabet. <laughs> but it's kind of easy to do. You can use it in your class. Uh, the any computer will do it. Students can start using it straight away with their phones or whatever it might be. Um, and I usually use a storyboard with that and a couple of handouts, so I'll show those a bit later as well. Um, let's see what else we get. So there's a few other tools, uh, all in one apps like sock puppets, um, comic strip generators. Can do is one and uh, coding based apps like Scratch Junior. So, if you've got kids in Korea, I know they'll probably be using that one at, you know, at school. Uh, so, Sock Puppets is probably easy, and Scratch Junior would be quite complex. So, on the left, you can see uh, uh, there's all different coding blocks that are the actions for the actors in the, uh, or on the screen. So let's see, we can play a little bit of each of these just so you can get an idea as well. With Sock Puppets, you can recreate different scenes from your favorite story or have a guest speaker come and share the tip of the day. You can change the scenery or the props. Tell them the best part. It's free! <laughs> Once you sign up for the free account, You'll notice that there are several ways that you can jump in and start creating comics. There's the Create button that will take you directly to the Comic Builder. I like that they give you several different layouts to choose from. And I'll, now that I have a background, I'm going to go in and choose a couple of characters. I can continue from there. So there's my great comic. <coughs> Lots of different apps, lots of different ways to use to use it. Um, no matter which one you choose, you need to engage students in a process in order to get the story created. So let's have a look at that. And traditionally, if we look at the literature and the steps involved with creating these digital stories, it's kind of complex. And what I found is you 
doesn't really work for us. So in the TEFL, TEFL, TEFL and TESOL contexts, uh, a different approach is kind of needed. Particularly since technology is <coughs> not always required for the steps involved. And also, well, it's not always readily available. So uh, for us, the production process really kind of looks like this. First, uh, you get students to write, research, and rewrite. So they should be preparing about 500 word narration and you can give them support for that, maybe some peer editing. And you can do this either inside or outside the classroom. And whatever it is, you use it to develop the storyboard for the movie. So after you do that, you then go ahead and start looking for the media to use. So match it with the images, the music and sounds, record the narration, start to sync it. And again, you can either do that in class or set it for homework. The very last step requires technology, um, and that's the finalization, the recording, and the sharing of the digital story. So you need an, ed an editing application, and you need your previous de previously developed storyboard, and you can share it you know, online or just in class, in a closed class. So uh, bottom left, you can't really see that. There's kind of two digital handouts and um, they look at this kind of process a bit more. So the steps that we're looking at, you'd be looking at the first three steps, writing, developing a script, and developing a storyboard. So these can be done in a classroom, they can be done at home for homework, however you want to do it. It doesn't require um, technology. Usually I would give the tutorial, and I'd follow the tutorial with a storyboard handout, and which we'll see in a second, and then we'll do that in class. So that would take up like 20 minutes. So for the college students here, um, that's all they really need. 10 minutes tutorial for a Wii video, five, you know, 10 minutes on the storyboard, and then you can set it for homework and set them whatever unit you're going to do with <coughs> the they can do it. So it's not difficult. With young learners, it's a little bit more difficult, and uh, I'll be talking about a, a case study a little bit later that looks at what needs to happen with that. So after you do these things, uh, you've got four, steps four, five, and six. You've got to locate your images and your other resources. You've got to um, create the, the story or the movie using your editing application, and then you've got to share. So all of these things, you can do them in the classroom if you have a lab or whatever it might, wherever you're doing it, if you've got computers or if you've got phones. Um, but you can also set it for homework too. So um, to help students get their ideas and work together, this is the kind of handout I use. So I found it quite useful, uh, particularly with lower level students, to get them to start drawing something. So there are some images on the left there, a place for the images so they can start drawing something. So if they don't have the vocabulary that they need to talk about what they want to talk about, then um, they can start to draw it, then you go around a little bit later, you can help them with that. So as I mentioned, it serves as a good kind of five, ten minute kind of way to finish off a tutorial and it drives home for students what they really need to do for the task. Okay, so um, usually I give them this and then I'd follow it up and close off that lesson um, by guiding them to a few different sites uh, where they can actually get copyright free content. So there's just some examples here. Um, and if you want the PowerPoint later, you can actually click on those things too to go to the places that have the copyright free content. But for now, um, I'll talk about uh, an example that, um, where digital storytelling is used with young learners with a student in our program. So I'm, I work at Wilson University and I teach in Tissot Mall, so um, the MA program there, so it's teacher education. So in this case, um, 
we had uh, one of our students, a Korean student, and she's uh, working in the elementary school. So we had this question, uh, how is the process of digital story time received by fifth graders? And the teacher in the English club after school activity program, <coughs> he caps up for a So I thought, you know, they, they, both of them would quite like it and that it'd be favorable. Um, I also thought it'd be a good way for uh, some of our students, the MA program students, to practice what they're learning in a real world context. So for this project, uh, we use reflective practice as a method. So it's part of the action research tradition and it can be effective for researching the efficacy of instructional techniques while also developing and supporting professional development. So to this end, the teacher needed to maintain daily classroom reports and at the end of the project, these were compiled into a teaching diary. And that was coded for us to look at the results. We augmented this by um, using the classroom CCTV footage and this gave us some first-hand information from inside a classroom because I couldn't be there. So it gave me a way to kind of um, be in the classroom as well. Um, so that, in that way, it alleviated kind of data collector and implementation bias. Allowed me to review the teacher and student interaction and the learner and learner interaction and see if that matched with the teaching diary. And of course, to get that, we had to have permission. Uh, which is one reason why I can't show you any examples because I don't have permission from the parents to show the examples from those kids, uh, their work. Um, also, to control for attitudinal effect, uh, the digital storytelling process was integrated within the curriculum and it was presented as a regular part of instruction. So, uh, with the teaching and learning context, uh, you know, the elementary or the ACASA program at the elementary school, so that means the classes weren't mandatory. The students could choose among several different things that were going on. English was just one of them, so there's no grading requirement either. And the teachers just expected to help the students practice their language skills. So they're really free to use any resource, so it kind of worked quite well. Uh, the teacher who implemented it, uh, as I mentioned, was a, a student in our program. They had 10 years teaching experience three running this program, or the fifth grader um, program. And the learners were you know, elementary school kids. There's 20 of them all together, 12 boys, eight girls, and they were beginner to pre-intermediate. And they, like the teacher, had not used digital storytelling before. So the teaching material we use, we could break that down into software, hardware, and learning content. So first the software. Uh, for these guys, we used uh, Microsoft Photo Story 3. And the reasons we use it is it's free of charge, it uses a wizard to make the stories, and it's user-friendly, and it was also com classroom computer-friendly. Um, the hardware that we used were the digitizing tools, so we needed to get a scanner organized, we needed to get a microphone organized, so that students could record their narration and scan their activity sheets. Finally, the learning content. The text used was a sing-along book. And the name of the book is Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? And if you don't know what that book's about. Brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a red bear looking at me. Okay, so that's, that's the book. Um, and it's quite a popular book, I think, uh, here in Korea, so, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think probably it's popular uh, because teaching young kids can be a bit grisly at times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I worked hard on that one. <laughs> All right, actually, uh, pedagogically, the book matched uh, quite well with the previous rhyming and repetition things and sing-along activities that the students were familiar with. And it's those kind of patterns that kids kind of, you know, when they start out reading. Like it's so the book really also provides just the right kind of content for these learners, these kids, that they can easily manipulate and transfer to a digital storytelling context. So if you look on the left, uh, this is some downloadable content uh, that matches with the book. So uh, it's a physical book, and the physical book has this downloadable content. 
and they can color in the animal and they can make a new page, make some fantasy animal, uh, you know, write, write the model along with that. And the example is from the digitized version of the book. Okay, so for the teaching procedure, we, um, we implemented it over one full week of the program time. So what did that mean? That means uh, essentially six classes, 40 minutes each. And that's Monday through Saturday. So lesson one, we introduced the linguistic content. So we used the book, the brown bear text and we just familiarize students with the animals and the color vocabulary. In the second lesson, we introduced the digital version of the text, so that served as a good review. In the third lesson, solidified the target language vocabulary. So how did we do that? Uh, well, we used the downloadable coloring sheets. You can see those activity sheets we just saw. Uh, lesson four, the teacher led a whole class development of a digital story. So each student would color in their, their page and that would become one part of the story. So we used content from the original book as a retelling task. So lesson five was used for practice and reinforcement. So in this case, we had the students draw their own animals, so whatever they wanted, tiger, lion, whatever it was. So they labeled them and colored them accordingly. And again, we put that into you know, one student, one page. And we uploaded that, and the final product was watched as a, as a whole class. And then lesson six uh, was finalization of follow-up. So in this case, we expected students to create one entire digital story by themselves. So they had to draw their own animal, color it, label it, label several sheets in an order, decide on the sequence, and record the audio, the narration, and use the software to produce their own um, movie entirely by themselves. So at the end of the lesson, the teacher had to help a bit and uh, uploaded all of these to the class website to share with parents and their friends uh, before they watched all of them as a, as a class together. So they were like a minute each, so it's like 20 minutes to watch all of them. So the ultimate outcome. Well, um, I think ultimately several outcomes ended up emerging from this uh, particular study, both for the learners and the practitioner, and a little bit of an unexpected outcome as well. So first, uh, for the practitioner, uh, there were some frustrations. Now these included things like time management issues, getting scanners and microphones organized, um, working with students to digitize their work. Um, so I think it's the normal kind of frustration that occurs with using something for the first time or using something that you're not so familiar with. Um, but overall, the teacher found that the, you know, there were some positive and very worthwhile things coming out of, out of this, out of the use of this. Uh, and these things were uh, PD practice or professional development. So it allowed her to engage in some professional development, try out what was, what was for her and the students a new teaching technique, um, and integrate it well into the classroom setting. And develop a means of explaining language and delivering language practice to students in a different manner than what they're used to. So as for the students, several affordances emerge for them. These include things like um, increased classroom engagement. Um, it really did force them to shoulder the responsibility for producing um, rather than consuming knowledge. So we could observe increased dictionary work. We could see that there was a clear visible effort going into um, production of written and oral communication by the students over previous classes. It also uh, helped improve knowledge of multimedia technology, digital literacy, and language literacy. So students were curious about all the functions of the software, and they ended up exploring and employing those functions autonomously 
even though they weren't taught to look at those things. They, they looked at extra things and ended up using them when they created their stories. Uh, it also seemed to capture interest and spur their motivation, and I think that led to a little bit of increased learner autonomy. So several students mentioned that even though they felt their English skills were quite poor, they were eager to develop and show their stories due to peer interest in what they would actually create. So digital storytelling came to empower their self-confidence, allowing them to put a greater effort into working on the linguistic side of their story over, um, over what they may have ordinarily. I think it also shows that the digital storytelling project helps students realize the value of others' work and to listen to their classmates' thoughts. So it began to create a sense of ownership and accomplishment among students regarding their work. And due to this, the unexpected outcome was non acasa participant peer envy. And what does that mean? Well, uh, it really, it means there was an increased interest in the ACASA program um, generated amongst all the students not previously interested in becoming involved with the English club. They all wanted to end, they, they ended up all wanting to create these kinds of stories in English. And more importantly, I think this kind of behavior tells us that the young kids actually have a voice that they want to have heard. And perhaps some people are not really listening. So in closing, um, digital storytelling and the case study and examples that I've shown, um, I think using them with students can hand the process of making meaning from experience back to students. You can enhance the pedagogical process, both the teaching and learning levels, and it can move learners from media literacy, or the consumption of media, to media fluency, which is the creation of media and from telling to self-distribution. Thank you. Okay, there's two more examples, or you can ask me some questions. Do you, do you have the students like create a YouTube channel or something where they can store all their videos? Uh, Sometimes, um, but usually, if I recently when I used it with the college students here, I didn't do that because it didn't work out that way. So uh, I just used Wee Video for that. They could upload it anywhere they wanted, Facebook or YouTube or wherever it is. For students at the college level here, I would probably recommend that they actually bring it in and load it up on the classroom computer because that way you have a physical thing that you can copy and you actually know if they've done it or not. You, you know if it will work or not. Uh, they can test it on the first class and then you actually use it in this, you play it back in the second class. Um, if you've got 40 kids, it's a bit rough. 40 college kids, it's a bit rough. Um, so I, I, yeah, I probably wouldn't use it in that case. If you've got 20 kids, it works out quite well because that's about 20 minutes or if they really go overboard you know two minutes each that's a 40 minute class right there so um, you can play it back in one class that that's you wouldn't want to extend it over to two class periods it's a bit much does the we video software uh, save the video on their servers and give you a shareable link it, sa it saves the video or it saves your project uh -huh. on their server and you can download or send it to a whole bunch of different places. So um, Google Drive or Facebook or wherever you can download it, yeah. It, does it have a, a link to yes, share? That's, yes, it, it, it has a shareable link. Cool. Uh, yeah, okay. from, from memory. Cool. <laughs> Checking it right now. Nope, no, no, <laughs> uh, Any other questions? Um, what about like when students are supposed to do like a speaking presentation? You mentioned that it would help like with the kids who hide their faces and you can't hear their voices. Do you think that would be? Uh, 
Assuming it's within the right time limits, a suitable substitute sometimes? Uh, what I've done with that is I'd have them do a five minute presentation and that's too long for a digital story. So I'd have them do the five minute presentation and, and give me something that they're, they end up reading uh, anyway. And um, so that I can, if they, they end up doing that, then you've got something to assess them with on that five minute thing or 10 minute thing, whatever it is, if it's a group thing or whatever. Um, but for the digital story, I would have them summarize that. And their task is to make it succinct. They've got to get that five minutes or ten minutes summarized to one or two. And that's how they make their story. So with the um, uh, class I used it with, with the college students here, uh, the topics that they had were speeches. So they, they ended up making a little bit long speeches. So I wanted them to really make them succinct. So they, um, they had two minutes to make each speech. So whether it was a self-introduction or a, a sequencing speech or a, a perform a task or whatever it might be. So they would present and do their speech and that might take five minutes and then they'd do a cut down version which would take one. Did you find that there were particular challenges and benefits uh, to assign this as group work versus individual work? Was it more successful one way or the other? I've generally only used it individually, so okay. with um, with under with undergrads and and, um, and postgrads as well. Uh, with the uh, if they're English department, yeah, it works a lot well. Yeah, it works a lot better um, for the general college kind of students. Uh, it can be a bit of a mixed bag, but they all like doing it. Um, but what you get back is somewhat different. That can be a bit of a challenge. So um, it, it depends on what kind of classes you have and how you might integrate it within whatever you're doing. Any other, any other questions? I noticed that uh, when you changed your glasses, you started making really funny jokes. <laughs> uh, are those humor blockers? <laughs> Did you guys notice that? You're killing it after that. <laughs> so if I, if I take off the blue blockers, yeah. <laughs> These are my smart glasses. That's what it's about. Okay, you've got the cheat notes at the table three. Okay. Okay, thanks, Dave. Thanks.